A very warm welcome to everyone. This is your host, Afreen Siddiqui, and I'm very thankful to all of you for taking out the time for today's session. For our new patrons who do not know much about us, I would like to quickly let you know, Quantency. Quantency is a pioneer algorithmic trading research and training institute. Our focus is on preparing professionals in the financial industry for the contemporary field of algorithmic and quantitative trading. Today's webinar, it is all about how can one maximize long-term growth through risk management. So to start with today's webinar, I do want to introduce our speaker, our very own, the very inspiring Marco Nicholas Tebow. Before I hand it over to Marco, I would like to give a quick brief about him. Marco specializes in quantitative finance and algorithmic trading and currently serves as head of the quantitative trading desk in Argentina, Belarus. Marco is also the co-founder and CEO of Quantico Trading, a firm devoted to the development of high-frequency trading strategies and trading software. To talk about Marco's educational background, he holds a bachelor's in economics and a master's in finance from the University of San Andres. Marco and Quantensity have been in association since the year 2014. And let me remind all of you, that was the year Marco joined Quantensity as an EPATH student. That is the executive program in algorithmic trading. And since then, he has been a constant motivation for Quantensity. So I would like to thank you, Marco, for your continuous support to us throughout. So now, without taking much time, I would like to ask Marco to take it over from here and coach us on the topic for the day. That is, risk management, maximizing long-term growth. Thank you. Marco? Hi, friend. Thank you very Hi, much. You? Thank You're you very much for, for the nice introduction. And uh, well, thank you, Quantity, for the invitation. Uh, the topic today is something that, for me, is one of the most important topics, risk management. When I started uh, doing trading in some, I would say, 10 years ago, I, I, I thought that uh, the most important thing about trading was finding the right signals at the right moment, and, and that was a real objective. But uh, as soon as I started trading, I realized that, that Position, hand, position management and risk management was something really important. So I, I, I think this topic will will be very good for for the ones that are starting and and want to to know about this. Uh, I I will start uh, with some understanding of explanations of what is market risk, some measures uh, before we start. Uh, we will. Start We'll speak about standard deviation, sharp ratio, value at risk, maximum drawdown. And this will be very important to talk about uh, later about volatility targeting and the Kelly formula. We will make some comments about stop losses and we will also be doing some examples about hedging a portfolio. Okay, uh, I want to say that these topics uh, are, you can go really deeper in each of them. Uh, we, we have a time constraint, but uh, I will try to do the best to you to grab the, the meaning of these concepts. Okay, so what does risk management mean? For most people, uh, it's, it's driven by loss aversion. It's, it says we don't want to lose money. For the average people, Daniel Kahneman said that uh, the, the average people need to have two dollars to of winnings uh, if to realize one dollar of loss. It would mean something like a sharp ratio of two. This doesn't seem something rational. Um, the real goal, the real goal, is not to lose money but to maximize the long-term equity growth. And yes, we we should avoid risk, but only as it interferes with this objective that is maximization of the long-term equity growth. And the key concept here is how we handle leverage. Leverage will be the key to optimization. Okay, we, we said before that uh, 
maximization of alternative growth is the most important, but can we do that if we suffer a 100% growth? No, it's never optimal. So we will handle that later. Uh, one important assumption that we're going to take is that the, uh, the probability distribution of returns is Gaussian. The returns are normally distributed. And uh, no matter how optimal leverage is determined with any constraint that we will be using, it should be kept constant in order to maximize growth. Okay. Well, the importance of volatility targeting is first we have to handle which is the overall risk for my strategy of my portfolio. And to do that, we have to understand our trading system. We have to understand uh, which is the skew, the standard deviation, the real sharp, and avoid any overconfidence. Uh, you have to know if you can lose 20% of your capital in a day. Are you are you aware of, of that possibility? Okay, we're gonna understand some of these measures. The, one, the, the first one I want to speak about is standard deviation of returns. Is uh, most of you understand this this metric? Uh, this is a measure a measure of dispersion of, of the data around the average. Um, we have here the formula. It's very easy. And if we want to analyze it, we have to multiply. It doesn't grow linearly. We have to multiply the standard deviation of the trading period that we want to analyze. In this case, 256 days. And we will see later in one of the examples in Python, because I, I, the, the idea is to talk about these measures and quickly go with the examples in Python. Um, then the other measure is sharp ratio. This, this ratio um, is, is a performance metric and also a risk metric because it compares the average mean of excess returns of the assets or strategy above um, with respect to the standard deviation. Um, the lower returns will lead to the lower volatility of return will lead to a higher sharp ratio. Uh, we all we always mostly uh, uh, quote this ratio at the as, as the analyzed sharp ratio, and we multiply by n, by the expected returns. We multiply by n and the standard deviation by the root of, of the of n. And we will show I will show you that it's important also to calculate uh, not only a sharp ratio but a rolling sharp ratio to understand risk of our strategy. We will also see some examples about value at risk. Value at risk is an important measure that is taken in most hedge funds and, and banks. And it's a measure that helps us quantify the risk of our portfolio or the strategy we're taking. It's important that we can we can calculate. It's important to understand that we can you can calculate value at risk for any instrument or even for the portfolio. We can do separate measures for them. And it provides an estimate under a certain given degree of confidence of the size of the loss from a portfolio over a given period of time. It will be also a, a degree of confidence of the size of the loss of any strategy in a given period of time. The degree of confidence will be between 95 and 99 percent. Here we, we can see an example. If we have a bar of $100,000 at a 95% confidence level for a time period of a day, it seems to state that there is 95% probability of losing no more than $100,000 the next day. Okay. The assumption on the bar is that uh, the normality of returns, when we know we know that the returns of our strategies or returns are not not so normal. In there, are, there are times where we have patch of tails, and uh, we have to know and understand the values and correlations. If if they are realized, okay. But if if you have high volatility, the value the value of this will be greater. And the 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 advantages and disadvantages is well, it's very easy to calculate. You can break it down by asset by portfolio. Uh, you can use as a constraint of, of your trading capital, um, and 
the next the next measure we are gonna speak about is the maximum drawdown and the drawdown duration. Uh, maximum drawdown and maximum drawdown duration are two measures uh, that most traders use to assess risk. Market drawdown quantifies the highest peak to throw decline in the equity pool, which maximum loss you receive from the highest point of your equity to your lowest point of, uh, of, of until you recover. And the drawdown duration is the number of days or periods uh, which that drawdown occurred. Okay, I will show you some examples in Python. Anyone who has uh, any doubts about the, the code, I will send the code back to OpenTC and you can access after the webinar, I think so. First, we're going to load some data. For the city group stock between 2010 to 2017. We're plotting some closing prices to check if everything is okay. We are going to calculate the daily returns. We can this return to check if they are almost normative. This really, this, this seems to be some, this seems to be almost normal. Uh, check the statistics, standard deviation, the expected mean. And then we're going to calculate the analyze expected mean. It's 8%. The standard deviation, analyze also. And some important metric that I like is the role in standard deviation. Because as I told you before, you can, uh, when you make this calculation of standard deviation, you, you need to understand that if you're taking the whole period, this standard deviation would be like more smooth, like it would be an average in taking a, a lot of data and it, it would be sometimes underestimated and sometimes overestimated. So I like to check the only standard deviation in order to check the maximum and the minimum. This block got both of them in the same chart. We can see that the standard deviation is around 30%, 34%, but the role in standard deviation for some moments is above the 50% level. So be careful. If you you take the standard deviation for the whole period, you could you could be underestimating the real volatility of this strategy. Okay. And also we take the, the skewness. That is a measure of asymmetry. So I was talking about skewness, skewness, and uh, metrical asymmetry. And we, if we have a negative uh, skewness, we are talking about a uh, fat tail on the negative side. And there is a wiggle. We could, we could be expecting higher losses than what, what is a normal distribution. And in this case, we have it. After that, we are going to calculate the sharp ratio. that we told you is the is a, the level of of the expected return in respect to the the risk we're taking we have a uh, 12 percent so uh, one two the uh, one two sharp ratio and also the sharp the rolling sharp ratio we plot them together these measures I want to I want to speak about this measure later when we talk about what we're targeting that is more, the most important aspect of this area. Value of risk also we have a value of risk if we take a portfolio one hundred thousand dollars of three thousand three thousand five hundred dollars is is what we should expect no more no a um, uh, lot no more than uh, hundred dollars yeah, 95% of the time, as I told you, the, 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 from the highest peak to the valley, the maximum one in this case would be uh, 35 percent, and it would be you know, more than a, more than three years. Okay, more than two years. Going back to the slides. Well. 
setting up a digital after after seeing all the, the risk measure is the question how much risk do I want to take? The the, the risk measure I like to take is one expected standard deviation with that which I call the volatility target. It, will, it can be measured in percentage or even in cash and over different periods of time. The daily cash volatility target will be this, the average expected standard deviation of the daily portfolio returns. Volatility target is the long-term average predictable risk. And this predictable risk depends on the strength of your forecast and the current spec correlation of asset prices. In any case, you, know, you have to know the actual amount of loss or gain on any given day, they will be random. Uh, so the estimation of risk only tells you an average of gains and losses, okay? And the, the best proxy for this risk is the annualized cash volatility target um, that is a uh, easy, easy, easy way to calculate this is the expected daily standard deviation of returns multiplied by the square root of 256 or 16 multiplied by the trading capital you're using. Okay, so we have to answer four questions in order to determine our position size or how much risk would do, do we want to take, how much leverage do we will be taking. How much can you lose? How much risk can you tolerate? Can, can you rely that level of risk? And is this level of risk the risk, the right level of risk for your system? Okay, the first question is how much can you lose? Okay, in any case, what I would recommend is never borrow money. Okay, just use what you have. Uh, it's very difficult to trade with borrow money, so that would be the first answer to the question. Okay, can you, oh, the, the second question is, how much risk can you tolerate? Or oh, can you cope with that risk? Okay, for example, you have to understand that uh, taking a normally, normal distribution, you if you have a trading capital of $200, you estimate your volatility and you have a volatility target of 200,000 or 200%, your annualized cash volatility the target will be 400, $400,000. If you make uh, the, the, the number, you, you, you make the calculation for Jordan and, and the expected loss in a, in a day, you will see that the, the, the expected loss in a day could be also, could be $2,000. Can you expect, can you tolerate that, that kind of loss to $20,000? And, uh, and can you cope with a $60,000 Jordan around 10% of your time? Okay, that would be something very difficult to tolerate, I think. So that's the way we are going to estimate our leverage. If you if you want a volatility target, in this case of 200%, and you have uh, an equity of uh, you have a volatility uh, of volatility of 100%, you have to leverage for uh, into two times your equity. Can you realize that uh, that level of, of risk this time? In that case, if if you have, for example, a shorter bond with a volatility of five percent a year, if we don't use leverage, it's impossible to to go to a fifty percent volatility target. Okay, we will should we should leverage ten times, and that level of leverage would be very difficult to handle. Uh, also, you have to know if your broker can can give you that level of leverage also. Um, if you, as I told you, check if you had that kind of leverage. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that, that level of leverage in any, in any instrument. And uh, ensure that your volatility target won't, work, uh, won't wipe out your account. Is this the right level of risk for, for you? Okay, do not ignore the compounding of return. Suppose you have a profitable strategy that you lose 90% of your account in the first trade. Then you can lose. Then if you have a strategy that wins 190% in the next time, you won't be able to recover from the loss, okay? So you have to understand that you don't have to be so overconfident 
and let's try to okay the next thing we are going to speak about is the chemical theory to answer these questions one of the one of the key formulas that was formulated is the chemical theory it's used by professional gamblers to and traders to maximize profits the key idea here is to use your sharp ratio and to determine how you should set your volatility target and leverage. Assume that your probability is to be some return discussion. The formula says the leverage is the expected the mean excess the mean of the excess of returns divided by the standard deviation the, the, the variance of the excess of returns. As I told you, uh, one one of the key assumptions here is that the returns are normally distributed and in that case, this this level of leverage will be giving you the greatest or the highest compounded growth rate of equity that was our key objective at the beginning. Remember that we want to optimize or maximize our level of, of, of uh, equity growth. In that case, if you use this formula, you will be getting that compounded growth. But as I will show you in this example, how to calculate the Kelly fraction. And you can take a more example prices from 2001 to 2017. And closing prices. Distribution of returns. We calculate the mean excess return on the sub ratio, and the deviation analyzed, and the Kelly fraction. Okay, in this kind of, of if we were doing a buy and hold strategy with, with JP Morgan, this will this this number of uh, 0.19 says that we should be using almost 20 percent of our equity in this strategy in order to optimize our compounded growth rate okay our com compounded leverage return would be 0.04 uh, four percent sorry okay another example here with some some statistics uh, parameters sorry is if we have a mean return of 10%, some deviation of 12%, and a risk-free rate of 3%, we calculate the mean excess of return, and the practical fraction will tell us that we should be using four, four, uh, five times uh, our equity. If, if we should be borrowing, if we, if we have a 100,000 portfolio, we should be borrowing $400,000 in order to uh, obtain that level of leverage and the sub ratio will be 0.62 and the compounded level of return of this strategy will be 22 percent okay also you you can see that uh, what clinical training implies is that you have to set your volatility target equally to the sharp ratio. So if we think that our sharp ratio is 0.5, in that case, the higher growth rate would be achieved if we follow a 50% volatility target. But be careful here. Something important that I showed at the beginning is that you can make mistakes calculating your, your distribution parameters. Okay, you can you can underestimate your volatility overestimate your returns and in that case you will be using higher levels than the one you need okay so that could be dangerous if you're you if you are overconfident and, uh, with, your, with your strategy it's very difficult to, to estimate your sharp ratio so i will always i will always suggest to use lower leverage than what your what your kelly formula says to you even if I have a sharp ratio of 1%, we should not use 1%, 100% volatility target. As I told you, 
sharp ratios are difficult to be backtested or highly achievable in the future because we we, we, we you know that if you take uh, a back test you will be mostly doing some uh, you you surely will be doing some or fitting or some or you will be having asset or strategies that are no longer in the in the past uh, were no longer uh, able to pass so you will be overestimating your sharp ratio and, and in that case you will be overestimating your leverage the leverage you should use uh, the Kelly criteria as you see can be very aggressive it's very difficult to to handle five times your uh, 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 leverage of five or five times your your equity, uh, you could suffer large drawdowns. So some of the some of the traders use the half uh, uh, half Kelly, and we need 50 percent of what your Kelly formula says to you. Another use of this formula is to use it as an up bound. Uh, you could be use it like in this time if we have a uh, half Kelly, you could say that you you could never be using uh, two and a half uh, leverage. Uh, level of flavors from your equity and what I found as a recommended the percentage of volatility target in the case here we have different examples of uh, real realistic practice sharp ratios in if I have a for example if I have a 0.75 realistic back test sharp ratio with uh, with a distribution of returns of uh, of uh, let's say uh, um, sorry we, we are positive skew we, we could be using a 35 percent volatility target in order to uh, to optimize our strategy that would be half well, a volatility target uh, one of the, the key aspects of the key formula the Kelly formula is that you have to keep on um, recalculating your position if you if you suffer a loss, you will be selling in order to maintain your leverage. And if you win, you will you you will have to buy more in, in case you're doing a buy hold strategy in order to maintain your level of leverage. And I, I recommend doing this at least one once a day when you want to maintain a level of leverage constant. Well. As I told you, uh, even, a, even a half Kelly may not be so conservative. Uh, another check that you can do to 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 constrain your, your level of leverage would be calculate. Say what is the maximum drawdown you you could tolerate, and ask you also what is it was the maximum loss in one period of your strategy. If you divide one with the other one, you will you will see that if you have for example, your maximum drawdown you can tolerate is $1,000, and your maximum loss in the strategy when you run the back test was $2,000. Uh, well, you'll be using uh, 0.5 of leverage. Another key usage of the Kelly formula is to allocate your buying power. Your buying power, uh, F, is your le optimal level of leverage. That will be for each of the the different strategies or assets and the optimal level is given by this formula that is the covariance matrix the inverse of the covariance matrix multiplied by the uh, vector consisting of the excess returns the uh, mean of the excess returns i will show you an example quickly of that also here okay with time We have a portfolio of three assets, JP Morgan, Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, from 2001 to 2017. We do the same, regulated by the returns. After that, the same thing, we calculate the mean of the excess of returns, analyze the covariance matrix. And we do the Kelly criteria for this portfolio.
We can see here in identity. Okay, what this says, yeah, and it's not surprising, not, not really uh, surprised that we have a negative leverage for Citigroup because it has a negative excess of return. I think I would say that Citigroup has 50% expected return negative. So the chemical change can maybe to the Point one point six times short our our equity in, in that asset. We should be long one uh, one point three in J in J P Morgan and point five leverage in Goldman Sachs. And the compounded growth rate of this strategy would be at nineteen percent. The sharp ratio of this portfolio will be 0.54. And some uh, important comment here, and you have to know this, is that the compounding growth rate of the portfolio is 19%. That is higher than that of the maximum growth rate of the achievable by, by, achievable by any of the individual stocks. Uh, as an exercise I put here, you can verify that the compounding growth rate of J.P. Morgan it was the highest one period return on the three stocks is lower than the return of the portfolio. Well, uh, about stop losses, there are two ways to, to, to find your stop. Uh, you can set a stop loss. Uh, one is uh, exit whenever your loss is greater than a certain threshold. That's the, the most common way we use stop losses. And when a drawdown drops below a certain threshold, we, we use our stop loss to get out of the position. I want to I want to speak about stop losses quickly, but stop losses use it uh, in the first uh, in the first one of the aspects is in the first one of the aspects to 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 positions before you do your losses by threshold. And the important thing in stop losses where important is that this depends on the kind of start because. We have a mean reverting strategy. The question is, we should be uh, should we be using stop losses? Well, it depends. It depends first if our our mean reversion is still on track. Uh, if there hasn't been if there hasn't been um, a change and the and the this uh, zero surprise and, uh, have become we have changed and have have become momentum. Uh, because if we are using stop losses and, and, and think that uh, mean reversion still, you think that mean reversion is still there, if you if you find the opportunity to short or, or to to execute a strategy in, in that in that case, you will have a greater probability of of a profit. And if you think that there has been a regime change and you on your series is no longer no longer in a mean reversion series, uh, you should be using your stop loss. So so in that case, it would be a I would I would use this for stop losses. In the case of trend following strategies, uh, we we can benefit from stop losses because they are they are easy to implement. If the strategy is losing and the means, the, uh, it means momentum is no longer there, we should exit the position. Uh, we can use it to change the, this change of momentum to open a new position on the other direction and as a stop loss of the previous position. This is the key when we are using trend following strategies. Uh, do not suffer as much risk as many version strategies do. So stop losses, I would recommend to use it in trend following strategies. The conclusion is. Uh, I would recommend use stop losses in trend following strategies and not mean reversion strategies unless you check every time that your mean reversion process is still on and if, if your still process is still on, mean reversion process is still on, uh, you shouldn't be using stop losses, okay? Because the probability of a 
reversion would be greater. So just use it when you think your drawdown is 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 over, the draw the drawdown you receive in your back test. In that case, you may be finding a regime change and you should use it as a stop loss. And the last thing I want to speak is how to hedge an equity portfolio. In that case, we can use uh, index futures. Uh, I will show you an example of how to calculate beta. Beta is a parameter that is the slope of the best fit line of 10 when excess returns on the portfolio over the risk free rate is regress again against the excess returns of the index. We, the index. We are going to use standard and poor's and we are going to regress the returns of our portfolio to that index. And what we know, we, we should be, you know, uh, we should know is that um, the, if we have a beta of two, it means that our portfolio is more sensitive to the returns of the index. And if you have a beta of 0.5, the return, the, the portfolio is less sensitive to the index. The equation that we need to use is one obtained from the uh, from whole and is the number of contracts that we're going to use depends on the beta on the current value of the portfolio and the current value of one future contract okay this is the formula it's beta multiplied by the current value of our portfolio divided by the current value of one future contract and we're going to see one example here and then i will show you the python script how to calculate this beta so let, let's take a value of standard pool index of 2,656. And we, the, the standard pool futures for that day was uh, 2,670. And the value of our portfolio is 10 million. The risk free rate is 10%, uh, 3%. The dividend yield on the index is 1%. And the beta of the portfolio is 1.75. This means that our portfolio is riskier or is more sensitive uh, than uh, to the to the index, okay. So, one future contract we have to understand that is 250 times the index, okay. So the value of the future position will be 250 multiplied by the price of the future. The number of contracts we should be short is beta multiplied the value of our portfolio divided by the the value of the future position this says that we should be sh in short uh, 26 contracts if we want to hedge our position suppose i told you before that we we were we were on a level of the index of 2656 and we 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 are going to a different uh difficult uh, uh, weekend uh, suppose we, we have elections in Italy, and we don't want to have the risk of our portfolio on that on that the weekend, and we want to uh, be beta neutral, so we don't have to be sensitive to lean to the market. So uh, we want to short the futures. Okay. In that case, we shorted 26 contracts of the standard and Poor's on Friday, and suppose the index. I, I told you an example because uh, I was talking about the election in, in Italy, but you, you, you want it. Uh, the example I show you here is for two months. So we're going to hold the position for two months. Suppose the, the unit closes at two, uh, 200, uh, 2,496 in two months, and the future price is 2,510. The gain from the short position will be almost $1,100,000. And the loss in the index is like six percent. The index you have to know that pays a dividend of one percent annually. That would be 0.17 for two months. And the investor will be will have earned uh, a negative 5.8 percent on the index. Okay. The expected return on the portfolio would be uh, 1.575. That is beta for uh, multiplied by the return on the index less the risk-free rate. The risk-free rate for two months is 0.75. The expected return on the portfolio is, is uh, negative 10%, 10.76%. The expected value of the portfolio would be the value of the initial equity multiplied by one less the loss 
in the in the portfolio so it would be eight millions eight eight million nine hundred thousand and the expected value of the hedger position would be for for uh, the, the expected value of the portfolio plus the win or what we we have on the future position in this case we end with a uh, ten million twenty five thousand dollars that is greater than we that our initial position of the ten thousand uh, ten million sorry sorry with that. and uh, before we finish i will show you how to calculate this for a for a I will go quickly this but I don't, I don't have much time. Uh, we are going to do a portfolio of four stocks, Microsoft, uh, PepsiCo, John, Johnson Johnson, and we are going to use the SPY to estimate the beta that will be similar to the standard Poor's futures. Um, well, I'm going to run this very quickly. You can check that later. Okay, we want to use, we, want, we are using a 7% uh, of our investment in uh, Microsoft, 41% uh, uh, in Pepsi, and 50% of the portfolio in Johnson & Johnson, so have a portfolio that minimizes the, the variance of the portfolio. In that case, then we are going to use the returns of the Standard & Poor's, in that case, the ETF SPY, the SPY ETF, we use the and the model we use uh, OLS model to calculate the beta. And we find that we have a point fifty four uh, beta. It is that we, we say that our portfolio is less sensitive than the index in that case. And show you here fifty four percent. We want to plot the regression. We are regressing the returns of our of standard pools against the returns of our portfolio. And well, if we have I, I have the example here. If we have a future price of 2,600, 2, the, the portfolio value of 10 million, the beta of in this case 0.54. How should how many futures should we be using? Here's the future uh, value of the future position. Uh, we said is 250 times the value of the future. Well, we calculate the number of contracts and so we need eight standard and pure standard uh, uh, post future contracts to hedge our position if we want to be better neutral. Okay, I, I I think I, I was I I, go, I went very quickly and there will be a lot of doubts surely. But after, uh, before going to the question round, uh, I want to thank Pontisti in first place for inviting me to, to give you this webinar and most important I want to thank them the, uh, uh, of all the support given during the course and after the course and I would fully recommend taking the APAT program it was for me it was life changing I I, I learned from the different aspects about trading not only about markets but also about econometrics statistics and the most important for me was Programming because I, I didn't I didn't come from a from a computer science uh, background I, I didn't I didn't I didn't need I didn't I didn't know uh, anything about programming and thanks to Quantity I was able to to learn how to master strategy how to 
handle statistics, and most important, how to settle my own trading firm. Uh, we're trading in Argentina, and we are one of the first ones that are doing algorithmic trading in Argentina markets, and we, we are proud of that. And all th all, uh, I will be always grateful to Quantity for all the support, and, and they are still answering my questions. So thank you very much for all your help. Uh, let's go to the, to the, the round of questions. Hi, Marco. Thank you so much for the session. It was quite informative, I would say. And uh, I think you, you would be prepared picking up the questions now, right? Uh, yes, yes. I, I All, have, right. All right. I think I, think yeah. I have. Okay, okay. So, uh, everyone else, thank you so much uh, till now. Uh, what I would like to quickly remind uh, all of you is that if you do have any questions for Marco, notice there is a question panel at the right-hand side of the screen. So, please go ahead and put up your questions, and Marco will be putting up, uh, picking the questions for you guys. Uh, I have a question by Akil. Can you explain again cumulative standard deviation? I think uh, it's not cumulative; it's a rolling standard deviation. It's that we take different periods, we we add the next day, and we leave behind the the, the, the last day. In, the, in that case, we use 256 days. So we are rolling the calculation of the standard deviation in order to, if we have more volatile days. Uh, uh, near what we are doing the calculation, we are going to be having a greater standard deviation. So it's a more sensitive standard deviation than the one that is calculated using all the data. Okay. Um, I have I have a lot of questions regarding the the, the code of samples. Uh, um, I have one I'm proud. Chance book says that the truth the tra uh, to trust in a backtesting, the sharp ratio must be 0.2 minimum, but the basic sharp ratio is less. Why? Well, there are a lot of bias when you do a backtesting. There are a lot of, uh, you, for example, will not take into account slippage. That is something important. You, you are expecting to trade at that level of price. If you take daily data from Yahoo, like we are doing here, it's very difficult to, to, to expect to have that exact price of execution. Um, there's a lot of bias in the optimization. You, 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 you are going to, you're going to optimize your parameter and you may be overfitting. Um, you may be using survivorship bias. Survivorship bias is when you use, for example, uh, assets they only, you only have access to the assets that are still there. For example, you use stocks that, that are still today, but they are stocks that you are not using the sample because they are no longer there, because maybe they go bankrupt. And okay, there are a lot, there are a lot of bias in bias in back testing, and that's why you you should be back testing with a higher sharp ratio than the one you expect really to, to receive. Okay. Um I I have a question. Will simple mean reversion strategy work? Will work uh, work? Well, I think I found uh, mean reversion as my favorite strategy. Uh, I would say that uh, fair trading is uh, my favorite uh, and index arbitrage. So I would say that they definitely work, and I, I feel comfortable with them. So I, I prefer them. And this works for cryptocurrency markets. Okay, uh, I don't trade cryptocurrency, but I think that these concepts are, are way important for cryptocurrency trade notes. And you can use it. I have another question. When, can you elaborate a little bit more about how to utilize rolling updated Kelly criterion in volatility targeting? Well, I didn't, uh, I, I, I didn't, I, I didn't calculate a, a rolling Kelly criterion. What I calculated was a rolling standard deviation. Why that? Because 
say for example that you calculate only the standard deviation of all the uh, returns of your sample and you found like here I would say wait a second I will go back to my slide here for example we found in the sample that there was a quality standard deviation. If we, if we calculate the real one, the rolling standard deviation, we can see that from some moments, standard deviation was greater than 100 100%. So in that case, if you use the 40% standard deviation, you would be using a higher levers than the one that you should be using, okay? And if you, you use that kind of levers, the maximum levers for the Kelly criterion at the 40% level, you will be probably be wiped out. Okay, you will, you will definitely uh, receive a greater draw than the one expected, and you will be uh, losing all your account. Okay, in that in that case, if you went for that kind of levers, you would look for a 40% low volatility target with that kind of level of leverage, and you realize a 100% volatility target, you will be wiped out. Okay, and that's why I use this rolling standard deviation because I want to know which was the, the higher or which were the levels of my standard deviation if, 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 if I want to be more sensitive to the next period and not to take all the sample, okay, because it would be an average, okay. Um, I don't know if I have more questions. Okay, all questions are regarding the code. I will send the code back later on the slides also. Um, well, thank you all for your time, and I hope this serves you as an introduction to Rich Smiley. All right, thank you so much, Marco. So I, I certainly want to express a great, great deal of thanks to you, Marco, for your presentation today and for your time. And thanks all of you for particip participating in the session today. And just to remind everyone, we are recording today's session, and each of you will get a direct link on your email, all right? And if we have any questions that's been unanswered, we'll try and get your account manager get in touch with you. Okay, so with that, we are going to conclude our event for today. All right, so thank you so much once again for your time. And thank you, Alfred. You're welcome, Marco. Thank you. Have a great day.